What's on the horizon medically for extending fertility? Yeah, so there's a lot of interest in extending fertility, right? Like yep. up until, you know, 100 years ago, women were basically dying at 50 in the yeah. average age of menopause. So it's, it's a kind of a recent phenomenon that we're actually living a third of our lives, you know, post-menopause. But infertility starts to decline way before you go through menopause. So there's a lot of interest in trying to extend fertility. Now, of course, egg freezing, which we haven't talked about yet, um, is one of the ways you can extend fertility, and it works pretty well as long as you're young when you freeze your eggs. Um, but again, it's a relatively recent phenomenon. Not every bit. Not, you're not usually covered by insurance, and it's expensive, et cetera. So it's not the answer because you're paying basically half the IVF cycle to harvest, and then you're paying to freeze. Yeah, exactly. What's the cost of freezing? About a thousand dollars. Well, ten thousand dollars for the cycle, and then about a thousand dollars a year for storage. And you're recommending that women, if, if a woman came to you at 20 and yeah. said, um, you know, I'm going to, I just want to double down on my career right now. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to do X, Y, and Z. I think I want to have kids. I at least want the optionality. When should I freeze by? Are you going to just say, do it now? Because no. no. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't recommend all women in their 20s freeze their eggs because most of those eggs will never be used. So you'd be doing it for nothing because most of those women will probably not need IVF and get pregnant spontaneously, right? Got it. Okay. The sweet spot, we think, is like early to mid-30s. That's where it makes the most sense. Because like you're about to kind of get to the probability the cliff, cliff yeah. where it starts to really decline. <laughs> right. Okay. Right. And if it doesn't, if you think you might want to have kids, but you're not in a place in your life where you think that's going to happen in the next few years, then doing it early to mid-30s is, is probably the time where it's most cost-effective. Very high likelihood that you will use them, if yeah. not for the first kid, maybe for the second kid. Um, and, you know, at that, it might be worth spending $10,000 and a thousand dollars a year. A thousand bucks a year. Right, right. And do you freeze them, you freeze every egg you retrieve? Only the mature ones. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And yeah. what's the, for a typical 30-year-old, um, you're going to get what we talked about Probably earlier? Probably 10 to 15 per cycle, okay. sometimes more, but that's And average. how many do you recommend a 30-year-old do? Yeah. So there's some calculators online. So the younger you are, the fewer eggs sure. you need because more of them are going to be normal. So someone in 30, you know, I think 10 to 20 would give you a decent chance of success. No guarantees. There's never any guarantees. But even, you know, studies show that even if people use those eggs and then are not successful, the fact that they did something proactively, there's some psychological benefit in doing that. So even if, you know, ultimately doesn't work out or you don't end up using them. Um, but at that age, maybe 10 to 20, obviously, if you're, you know, as you get closer to 40, you might need 20 to 40 or 50, which is not practical for most people, right? Because you can't do that many yeah. cycles and it's expensive and there's risks involved. So so I think egg freezing is a great option for, for women. I also think as a society, we should try to make it easier, obviously, for women to have kids during their peak reproductive years yeah. in their 20s and 30s. So it's a whole different question. But I think having options is, is a good thing. Tell yeah. me what the freezing process is like. So the freezing process uh, these days is one called vitrification, it's called, and, and it's like this special kind of freezing that doesn't result in ice crystals. So, so how do you do that? And there's a process that it happens in the lab. There's a machine <laughs> that does it, that lowers the temperature. and uh, So the rate at which they lower the temperature? Right. It's rapid. Okay, so it's like as a liquid nitrogen to, dump, right, basically. Right, yep. right, as opposed to old days when we did slow freezing. Yep. Um, so it becomes like a glassless, glass-like state without wow. crystals. But the it works really well, and the survival is really high. And, and then you store them at what temp? Like liquid nitrogen temp? Yeah. Yep. So yeah. They're, 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 yeah. it's not like in your freezer. No. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. And, and then how long does it take typically to get the genetic results back? Uh, typically within a week or two. Okay. Yeah. And what depth of genetic testing is being done here? Are you doing whole genome sequence or are you just looking at a handful of SNPs yeah. that are pre-identified as the ones that matter? Yeah, good question. So it's evolved over time. And I should say it's still very controversial because there's always a risk of harming the embryos. You're only looking at a few cells. So is it really representative of the embryo? I mean, we do it a lot. And 
the data definitely shows that if you transfer a normal embryo, it has a very high chance of implanting. But the issue is recently has been, are we discarding embryos that are maybe normal uh, because we think they're abnormal based on the genetic testing, but the genetic testing is flawed. It's a whole so presumably genetic testing is really easy to identify aneuploidy. That's, it's, chromosomal it, analysis yes, is trivial. It's geared up to do that, right? Okay, You're right. So most of the time, we're using something called next generation sequencing, which is, you know, very uh, high level sequencing, but it's not whole genome yep. sequencing. So you're getting targeted, yeah, and you're looking mostly at chromosomal abnormalities, unless you know that the couple is a carrier for some genetic mutation that you also want to screen for. Yes. I'm Peter Atia. This podcast relies exclusively on premium subscribers for support, which allows us to provide all our content without taking a single penny from advertisers. I believe this keeps my content honest, making it a trusted resource for listeners like you. As a premium member, you'll get immediate access to our entire back catalog of AMA episodes and all future AMA episodes. You'll get longevity-focused premium articles packed with actionable insights, You'll get unrivaled show notes for each and every episode of The Drive, every topic, every study, every resource from each episode carefully curated for you. You'll get quarterly podcast summaries where you'll learn my biggest personal takeaways from the previous 90 days of expert guest episodes and much more. This journey doesn't have to be navigated alone. We can take these steps towards a better, longer life together. Become a premium member today at peteratiamd.com forward slash subscribe to join me in a shared commitment to a healthier future.